In the first part of this lecture, the beginning, I said the New Testament was the most, uh, the best-selling book in history. Uh, really, what I meant was the Bible is the best-selling book in history. But rather than go back and reproduce the whole thing, I thought I would just correct that here. And of course, the New Testament is part of that. Uh, another thing is that at the end of the last uh, part one of, of lecture one, we talked. Uh, there was a video about producing ancient an ancient form of book, uh, probably the most primitive form, uh, with wooden covers and using parchment pages that were folded and sewn together. That most ancient form is called a codex, and while it is very early, it um, was not present during the time of the New Testament. They used parchment scrolls, that is, they were rolled up and written in columns. And at some point after the New Testament period, someone got the idea that it would be easy to transport and handle the scrolls, not have to you know, worry with opening and closing them and rolling them to cut them apart every two columns and sew them together in what is called a codex. And so that's what you saw the guy making. So the most ancient form of book is called a codex. All right, from the Old to the New Testament, um, there are some big transitions that took place. If you've had Old Testament history, you will know this. If you haven't had Old Testament history, you may be missing a bit of context for the class, but it's still doable. The world power at the end of the Old Testament is Persia. When the New Testament begins, Rome is the reigning world power. Um, the form of Judaism at the end of the Old Testament was a temple. When the New Testament begins, it is the temple and the synagogue, which was kind of the community center and the place where children were educated and that kind of thing. The religious groups at the end of the Old Testament, there, was, there were priests. Political situations between the Old and New Testament uh, gave rise to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which we will talk about later as well. The leader... As the Old Testament end, there, there was no king. And when the New Testament begins, there is a king, but he is a Roman subject. So Israel is a, con is a conquered territory of Rome. And then the language at the end of the Old Testament is either Hebrew or Aramaic. When the New Testament begins, it is Greek. In 587 BCE, by the way, uh, I'll be using AD and CE and BC and BCE interchangeably in this class. AD means, uh, is the Latin Anno Domini, it means in the year of our Lord, and BC is before Christ. But for people who do not use Jesus as a reference point in history, and many scholarly writings, if you read journal articles, they will say, they will use BCE, which means before the Common Era, and CE in place of AD, meaning the Common Era. So before the Common Era, Common Era, BCE, CE. The convention is to write CE before the year and to write BCE after the year. So you can see here, 587 BCE uh, would be counting backwards from the year one. By the way, there is no year CE zero. It starts with year one. So 587 BCE, Jerusalem falls to Babylon. In 539, uh, Cyrus, uh, this is all part of the Old Testament now, uh, Cyrus gives an edict um, when Babylon falls to Persia, uh, which ends the 50 years in exile. And so the people of Israel are able to go back and rebuild the temple. And in 515 BCE, the temple is finished and the Old Testament period ends. In 334 BCE, Alexander the Great is really going uh, big in his campaigns. And he defeats the Persian Empire and pushes them back as far as India. And so, you know, Alexander the Great, great conqueror, I'm sure you've probably studied him. Those of you in the military have probably so to his military campaigns, he's big in history. But in 323, he died at 32 years old, which seems kind of young, but, you know, with no modern medicine, he could die of an abscessed tooth or something. 32 years old is about the life expectancy in that time. In any case, 
When he died, he had no successor. So his four generals divide the territory uh, that he had conquered. And there are two that are important to New Testament studies. One is Ptolemy. And he ruled over, he and his, his descendants ruled over Egypt. Um, and so they took over about 320 BCE and ruled uh, over uh, 122 years. And then the Seleucids, the general Seleucid and his descendants, ruled over Syria and Palestine, of course, lies halfway in between. The Ptolemies, who had control of the, the area of Israel to begin with, were very mild rulers and let the high priest rule and didn't really interfere. Uh, by the way, here is the empire of Alexander. And you can see here that, you know, here is Israel. And the Ptolemies are down here. The Seleucids are up here. And one of the things about this piece of property that is important through history is that you can't go across the Arabian Desert if you plan to live. Uh, so the choice is to go around where there is water sources and the climate's a little more mild. You aren't out there in the sand. And so uh, to get from here down to the African continent uh, or to get over uh, to go from the African continent over this direction, you have to go right here. And whoever controlled this area right here also controlled taxes. So this makes, makes it not only a very hotly contested piece of property for religious reasons, but also for business reasons, because countries wanted that tax money and they could tax any merchant that was going through there. So that's one of the reasons it was uh, always, you know, there are many reasons this area of the world has been hotly contested, but that's yet another one. In 198 BCE, Antiochus III, who is a Seleucid, those are the guys in the north, took Palestine away from Egypt. The Seleucids were disciples of Greek culture, and they encouraged the Jews uh, to engage in the Greek language and customs, which means that the Jews adopted Greek culture, and some, I mean, some of the more liberal Jewish people adopted Greek culture to the point of participating in athletic games in the nude, which was, of course, common for Greeks, but uh, taboo for Jewish people to do. Antiochus Ep Epiphanes uh, IV uh, was not a very nice guy. Uh, and the, uh, often the Jewish people in the day would call him Antiochus Epiphanes, which means Antiochus the Insane, not, Antio not Antiochus the Great. He actually defiled the temple in, 167, in CE 167 by sacrificing a sow on the altar to the Greek god Zeus. And so to say that he was a little bit heavy handed would be an understatement. Because he was forcing the priests to uh, bow the knee to Greek gods and Roman gods, Mattathias, uh, who was a priest, and his five sons revolted against uh, this guy's rule. Mattathias actually was an old man, and um, you know the life expectancy wasn't that long anyway. And with the rigors of having to hide out in the hills and the kinds of things that guerrilla campaigns have to do, he died. And so his son Judas took over, and he is called Judas the Hammerer or Judas Maccabeus. And uh, so the Maccabean Revolt takes its name after Judas's nickname. Antiochus IV finally dies after a lot of fighting, and the Syrians finally compromised after a lot of fighting and allowed religious but not political freedom for the Jewish people. And so in 164 BCE, uh, they were able to rededicate the temple, and there wasn't enough oil for the lamps, and the miraculous uh, part of the oil lasting as uh, longer than it should have uh, when they rededicated the temple because those those lamps had to stay lit is now the festival of Hanukkah and then uh, by the way my, my, my neighbors are, are Jewish here in Anchorage Alaska and it seems like we have a lot of Jewish friends here and um, they uh, the woman who the, our, our kids grew up together and um, 
their parents were grew up observant Jews, but since they have moved out of their parents' house, they're they're secular Jews. They don't really oops, I just bonked the microphone. They don't really observe um, the Jewish holidays and all that kind of thing. They grew up kosher, but they're not kosher now. But there's some things they won't eat, like like shrimp. You know, shrimp is like a cockroach on steroids. They say they can't put one in their mouth. Pork is another thing they just won't eat. And their kids were over at my house one night, and I had grilled pork chops. And uh, the little boy said, wow, this is really good. What is it? And I thought, oh, no, I'm feeding pork chops to Jewish kids. Not a good thing. So I called her mother and confessed, and she laughed, and she said, well, don't do it again. <laughs> so you live and learn, right? Okay, anyway, some of the Jewish leaders thought that religious freedom was not enough, and so they continued fighting. Judas Maccabeus died in battle. Jonathan takes over. Then he's assassinated in 142 BCE by Trypho, who is an Assyrian general. And then uh, Simeon takes over. And the Syrian king Demetrius II finally grants the Jews political independence in 142 BCE. That freedom lasted until 63 BCE, that is approximately 80 years. It is the only time of Jewish independence until the mid 20th century. Now, the part of the religious or the religious and political intrigue going on during this time has to do with the two groups called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The two groups were two political groups were allies for religious freedom, but they parted ways over fighting for political freedom because uh, the Pharisees said religious freedom is enough, but the Sadducees were more politically aligned and they wanted political freedom and they decided to keep fighting while the Pharisees said no. And so that's for the, for the division between the two groups begins. 